So, everybody, welcome to our third event. As you know, we've already had two fascinating speakers in uh, the former White House correspondent for Voice of America, um, and we've also had uh, Ron Rappaport from William & Mary. Um, so we have gone outside uh, Maryland, David. We've had Virginia as well. Um, so we're moving out from Washington as we go on. Now, our three speakers this evening are going to tell you a bit about their organisation, what they do, and how they're involved in affecting the election. Uh, let's start with Cynthia Ritchie Taylor to explain she's the founder and executive director of Represent Women um, and she's also a member of an organization called Reflect US Coalition and she's now I, I'm going to say outspoken it's what she says in her her piece that she's an outspoken advocate for rules and systems return um, reforms and to advance women's representation and leadership in the United States and um, she's going to speak first then we have David Levine who we've probably met before you've known some from some of you know David and um, he's the elections integrity fellow at the Alliance for Security and Democracy in DC but also he's someone who's worked in elections for many years I've met him you might remember in Richmond in Virginia um, and we finally got Sam Novi, who's co-founded Baltimore Votes Coalition, uh, which is a coalition dedicated to ensuring every resident in Baltimore in Maryland is included in the political process. Um, I don't want to do too much talking at this point because we've only got them for an hour. So we'll start with their introductions and their talks, and then we'll have questions for about half an hour afterwards. Cynthia. Thank you. How exciting. You know, I have to be honest, I wish I were there in person with everybody in the UK. It would feel a little bit of a relief because things are a little bit um, tense right now in the United States, but I suppose everybody is experiencing that in one way or another. But anyway, a real pleasure to be uh, talking with everybody uh, today and these esteemed panelists. So um, my, I'm trying to think what to put in my nutshell. In a nutshell, I worked on campaigns for years. I worked on campaigns for president, governor, Congress, uh, an ERA campaign in the state of Iowa in 1992 when certain presidential candidates and their wives didn't support an Equal Rights Amendment. So I got to go up head to head with Phyllis Schlafly and a few others about the ERA, but that's, that's a, a story for another session perhaps. Um, and then I also worked on some ballot measures for um, voting system reforms. And through that process, I really got to see the underbelly of the American electoral system. I think everybody hears about it and knows about it in, for different reasons. But when you work on a campaign, you soon realize that only certain voters in certain districts really matter. And there are huge swaths of the population who are never expected to participate, who live in uncompetitive districts and uncompetitive states and are largely ignored in, um, in congressional elections and also in um, presidential elections, probably what, 10, 11, 12 states really matter. That's a little bit fluid right now, but anyway. Um, so with that background in mind, I, I founded, helped to found an organization called Fair Vote with my husband, Rob Ritchie. And that really looked at a number of reforms that we thought were super important. Affirmative right to vote in the US Constitution, universal voter registration, an end to the Electoral College as we know it, um, and perhaps most importantly or formatively, an end to winner-take-all elections. You know them in the UK as first past the post. Um, we largely inherited them, but we changed the name of them and call it winner-take-all voting in the United States. The consequence of winner-take-all voting in, in the US um, and in the UK's other former colonies, though New Zealand, Australia, a few other places have seen the light and changed their systems, um, is that we have a system that really protects incumbents, it limits competition, and it really fortifies the status quo. And when you have a fortified status quo of incumbents who are largely older and whiter and more male, I won't say maler because that doesn't sound very eloquent, um, you have a return election after election of that, of that uh, portion of the population. So my organization is trying to combat that high um, re-election rate of incumbents by looking at the systems that produce those outcomes and not so much the preparation of individual women candidates, which we probably should get a prize in the United States for the number of organizations that quote unquote train and mentor and prepare women. I haven't heard of a one that prepares men to run for office yet. We have a lot of those in, in the United States designed to prepare individual women. And while those are important, they don't get at the systemic barriers that really are the roadblocks for women running. The US ranks um, 86th in the world for women's representation as of today. Uh, 20 years ago, we ranked 46th. And 
it is not that the women in those 85 countries are better prepared or more clever or more skilled or that the men are more sharing and justice, gender, gender justice oriented. It's that they have different rules and they have different voting systems. And so my organization, Represent Women, has looked at the best practices from around the world and now has looked at the growing body of information about best practices in the United States to come up with four main areas of work. We look at um, more intentional recruitment targets and donation targets so that women are more likely to be recruited to run for office and can run viable campaigns when they run. That's bucket number one, so that more women run. Bucket number two, our voting system reforms. The vast majority of the countries that rank above the US have some type of a proportional voting system. In the United States, we call that reform uh, rank choice voting. Um, you know it as the alternative vote uh, in different variations for multi-seat districts. It's called the single transferable vote. But all of those systems, hands down, elect more women and elect more diverse candidates. So um, that's, we see an essential part of more women winning. So you have women run women win. We also have to look at what happens once women get elected. Are they able to serve effectively? Is there on-site childcare? Is there paid leave? Uh, can you participate virtually? Of course, there's more open to that, openness to that now. Can you vote by proxy? Those are reforms so that women can serve effectively once they get elected. And then finally, how do we really make sure that women can lead? It's one thing to be in a legislature, but are you the chair of a committee? Do you get nominated to be a vice presidential candidate? Is there a norm around gender balance leadership at the cabinet level that a number of countries now are really pushing? And we see all that as, as essential for normalizing women's political power um, and can really accelerate the pace of progress. We saw Justin Trudeau in Canada appointed gender balance cabinet, Macron in France, South Africa and Ethiopia both have gender balance cabinets and we see that as an important mechanism. But I think perhaps the most transformative thing in terms of US elections, I'm happy to talk rattle on about my thoughts on that, is that there's a reckoning I think happening with a lot of things in the United States right now racism and problems with our economic inequality and so forth, but there's also a reckoning around our voting rules, our antiquated winner-take-all voting system, and uh, ways to change that. And uh, ranked choice voting is really gaining momentum in the states, and we see that happening in cities and in some states that are uh, looking to pass ballot measures this fall. So my organization is trying to be helpful. We just did a big report on all of the um, data on ranked choice voting options for women and people of color uh, in all the jurisdictions using it. And um, that's available on our website. Uh, but we're doing a lot of other interesting research and I'll wrap up just to say, we try to cover every, every place women could be in a decision-making body or might be marginalized from that. So incarcerated women, tribal women, women in US territories, women in the judicial system, women in the party nomination process, all those areas are things that we research. Then we turn that research into what we hope is helpful advocacy that's grounded in that research. Is that enough? Too much? Too That was brilliant, Cynthia. Thank you very much. It sounds like you fit quite a lot into your days. Um, <laughs> I'll, we'll come back to questions afterwards, but thanks very much for now, Cynthia. David. John, that's a, that's a tough act to follow. I'm, I'm going to do my very best. I, I, you know, it's a pleasure to be here with Sam and Cynthia, and it's a pleasure again to be here with Democracy Volunteers. You know, for those who don't know me, my name is David Levine, and I'm the Elections Integrity Fellow for the Alliance for Securing Democracy. That's a bipartisan transatlantic initiative housed at the German Marshall Fund of the United States, which develops comprehensive strategies to deter defend against and raise the cost on authoritarian efforts to undermine and interfere in democratic institutions, including elections. Right? ASD brings together experts, not only on election integrity, but disinformation, malign finance, emerging technologies and economic coercion, as well as regional experts to collaborate across traditional stovepipes and develop cross-cutting frameworks for addressing authoritarian threats. And just real briefly, since its, loss, since its launch in 2017, ASD has grown to a team of 21 staff in Washington and Brussels that analyzes a range of tools that authoritarian actors such as Russia, China, and Iran are using to undermine democracy in the United States, Canada, Europe, and beyond. And using innovative digital tools, right, ASD's analysis has contributed to public and 
policymaker understanding of foreign interference campaigns, and broader authoritarian efforts to undermine democracy. Our experts have shed light on how authoritarian interference affects the integrity of the elections, which of course is an increasingly critical dimension of our work as the 2020 US presidential election unfolds. The 2020 election has been and will likely continue to be tumultuous. We have already witnessed foreign interference efforts by Russia, which the intelligence community has highlighted and warned against. Meanwhile, domestic players continue to undermine perceptions of the integrity of the election, playing into authoritarians' hands and threatening to discredit democracy. Social and political divisions within democracies continue to widen, providing more opportunities for foreign actors to exploit. But regardless of who occupies the White House in January 2021, these challenges are not likely to dissipate and efforts to address them will remain urgent. More actors, including domestic ones, are adopting parts of the authoritarian playbook utilized by Moscow, Beijing, and others to undermine democratic institutions and societies, right? And the development and spread of digital authoritarianism and accompanying technologies and related standards increasingly threaten privacy and freedom worldwide. As ASD's expert on the conduct of elections, my primary focus has been working with election officials and policymakers at the federal, state, and local levels and developing partnerships with like-minded organizations to devise strategies to strengthen election security ahead of the 2020 presidential election. In February, I published the Election Officials Handbook, a practical guide with recommendations for state and local election officials to improve election security at limited costs. That was circulated to the over 8,000 election jurisdictions across the country and generated interest not only among American election officials, but also among domestic and foreign journalists, European election officials, and election observers as well. Leveraging the network of partners my ASD colleagues and I have built, I co-authored a report in April with an ideologically diverse group of colleagues that documents the election security funding needs for state and local governments during the pandemic, in another report with the Bipartisan Policy Center, I outlined recommendations for mitigating potential risks associated with voting, more voting by mail. On August 4th, I testified before the U.S. House Homeland Security Subcommittee on Cybersecurity Infrastructure Protection and Innovation on steps that can be taken ahead of November to ensure the general election is safe, secure, and fair. And this Thursday, I'll be publishing a report with the International Foundation for Electoral Systems on how countries throughout the transatlantic region, including the United States, can continue to conduct secure elections amid the pandemic. My colleagues and I have also engaged with organizations with a dedicated interest in expanding ballot access and protecting voting rights. For example, ASD's Disinformation and Media Fellow Brett Schaefer and I have continued ASD's ongoing work with the National Urban League, drafting a piece entitled The Vote and the Virus, Inoculating the Election from Disease and Disinformation from its, for its State of Black America annual report. ASD is also providing web trainings for local chapters of the National Urban League, the League of Women Voters, and other similar organizations to help targeted communities better understand, identify, and mitigate foreign efforts to use information operations to suppress voter turnout. ASD also joined the National Association of Secretary of State's Trusted Info 2020 campaign to promote election officials as trusted information sources and is partnering with Common Cause on the left and R Street on the right to help election officials in 10 battleground states verify their social media accounts for November. Verifying election-related Twitter and Facebook pages and accounts is essential to mitigate disinformation being spread through imposter or hijacked accounts, helping to improve voter confidence in the legitimacy and reliability of information posted by election officials. By working directly with Twitter and Facebook, ASD and its partners are helping election officials navigate the verification process, patching a clear vulnerability prior to November. With the US presidential election now well underway, Right. Between now and Election Day, I'm focusing primarily on three things. One, as I mentioned before, I'm working to help local election officials in several states get their social media accounts verified if they haven't done so already. Two, at a time when many folks are focused on which of the presidential candidates is winning and losing, I'm giving talks and writing pieces about how the vote itself is happening and what's being done to protect the integrity of the election. 
For example, I'm serving as a contributor for the Fulcrum's watchdog blog about voting in 2020 and just published a piece yesterday with a colleague about the security of vote by mail. And three, I'm assisting journalists who cover the 2020 election to help ensure they, carry, they cover the various election integrity related issues in a balanced, informative, and accurate manner that hopefully helps inform but doesn't spook the public. Through the above efforts, ASD hopes to affect at least two outcomes. One, reassuring Americans that their votes will be counted, that it will matter, and that the people's will expressed through their votes will not be questioned and will be respected and accepted. And two, helping to ensure that attempts to interfere in the 2020 presidential election do not impact the election's integrity. I look forward to your questions. David, you caught me scribbling down things there. Um, thanks, David. That was really interesting. Thanks. Sam. Awesome. Uh, thanks so much for having me. It's great to meet you all. Uh, I'm Sam Novi. I'm a co-founder of uh, the Baltimore Votes Coalition. Uh, we're led by uh, grassroots organizations from across Baltimore that uh, help us in our mission uh, to uh, create community uh, around elections to create a sense of uh, pride in being Baltimoreans and showing up on election day, a sense of celebration, the idea that um, the, the election day and the, the, the month leading up to election day is kind of a, a moment for celebration of our neighborhoods and our uh, communities. And then most importantly, collaboration. You know, Baltimore is a hyper segregated city. Um, there's a lot of uh, just sort of uh, silos of people doing things in different places and a lot of shared stakeholders we have to deal with, like the um, local election administrators as we referred to uh, before. Uh, philanthropy is a major stakeholder that we need to uh, work with. Um, uh, state government is a major stakeholder we need to work with. And so uh, Baltimore Votes creates a way for um, uh, local organizations across Baltimore to come together and uh, make sure we're exerting uh, the voice of our communities uh, in, uh, you know, the, the rooms and Zoom, uh, Zoom calls where power is being, uh, being held uh, in, in administering elections in, uh, in our community. Uh, so, you know, we, we've been around for a few years now. Uh, people knew us best for a program uh, we ran in 2018 called Parties at the Polls, where uh, you know, we have a really strong culture of, uh, you know, sort of neighborhood block parties in uh, Baltimore City. Um, and so that really translated well um, to having uh, block parties at polling sites on Election Day hosted often by the polling site owner. So by the church or the school uh, where the voting actually happens. Um, and there's a lot of good um, research showing that when you do this, when, then, when, and when you most probably invite the whole community to come to that community event, you get a, a, a significantly higher level of voter participation. So uh, this year we've had to do a lot of things to adapt to COVID. Uh, so first off, we don't have neighborhood polling centers anymore um, and, and vastly uh, increased numbers of people voting by mail. Um, so we, uh, we switched parties at the polls to being something called party of the mailbox where you get a, I wish I had one of the boxes with me right now. We have a box full of uh, voting swag, um, a Baltimore Votes t-shirt. Um, we have a local art school that makes incredible. Uh, I love Baltimore, so I vote posters that are up all around town. I just got a shipment of yard signs we're including in the box this time um, right now. And so we, uh, uh, democracy uh, lovers in Baltimore, over 3,000 in a city of only 600,000 signed up for these in the primary, uh, sign up to get one of these boxes. And instead of having a party at your polling place, you have a party in your new polling place in your own home and you decorate it like Christmas. Uh, and then we have a Zoom call with a lot of DJs where uh, people kind of dance in their homes. And it, I know it sounds kind of hokey online, but people have a good time with it. Uh, and uh, we also do activations leading up to election day. So, um, uh, you know, so we had a big car parade uh, to the Dropbox um, in the primary. We'll have a couple of things like that. Um, you know, where, you know, even with social distancing, you can still get out there and play music and do, you know, uh, you know, one of our local uh, neighborhood partners just uh, put out this dance that everybody's going to do at the draft boxes. It's going to be very popular. Um, so that's been, um, you know, a big focus for us. And, uh, you know, going forward, we are looking at, A, providing really high quality information as, you know, this is a new voting process for a lot of people. So people have a lot of questions. And there's also a lot of disinformation, misinformation out there. So how do we provide really clear, 
easy to understand, easy to share materials that these folks who get involved with Baltimore Votes can then share with their own friends and family and their communities. Um, and we've also done a lot of poll worker recruitment. So, you know, we, we, have a, we had um, a lot of needs for poll workers this year. The current poll worker force is, um, you know, older and at high COVID risk. So um, that has been a major uh, focus as well. Um, and then going forward, I mean, all those activists who come in through Party of the Mailbox are the types of people who might advocate for the types of reforms that uh, Cynthia and David have been talking about. So um, uh, we're very much trying to uh, grow a base of people who love uh, democracy and are committed to the full participation of every Baltimorean in our political process. And then uh, we work to mobilize that base um, election after election and on issue after issue. Brilliant, thank you, Sam. Can I say that I've never met three more enthusiastic people about democracy? And um, perhaps it's because it's 2.30 there and 7.30 here, I don't know. Um, but um, thanks very much for those introductory comments. Can I ask you a question of Chairman's Privilege before we go on to the questions of the audience? Obviously, the biggest conversation we hear this side of the water um, about the US election is the impact of vote by mail um, and how it's going to have, you know, one side thinks it's uh, the devil incarnate, the other side thinks it's the solution to everything. Where is the balance in this? Obviously, lots of people want to vote by mail. Is this the solution to the challenges you have this? Yeah, I mean, so one thing I want to say is I think there's a real tendency to, to both sides, US political conversations. So there are not two sides to this issue. There is one side, a, a which, is that, which is that one in three ballots were cast by mail in 2018. It is safe, it is secure, it is used by our military, it is used by people across the country. and. The, what the people who want to suppress the votes of many Americans want to do is, is create confusion by making it seem like there's two sides to this issue. There are not two sides. There's, um, there's one process. You must forgive my provocative nature of the former academic. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to get, but like, I, we just got... Throat, I, I set the <laughs> seminar question and get the reactions. <laughs> David. You know, I, you know, I'll add on to Sam's point and just make a, you know, a couple of things, right? One is... Right. I think this, the, the security of the vote by mail process is well established. Um, it, is, it is a secure process, right? That, and, and many states have a number of checks and balances in place to help ensure that it's secure, whether it's being able to have ballot tracking systems, whether it's being able to have right, signature verification mechanisms, or, or whether it's right, any number of other checks in place that frankly make it so that the idea that, you know, you may have heard from some folks that the ability, right, that there's an ability to counterfeit ballots in other countries and, and nothing could be further from the truth, right? Um, you know, this, this, uh, the Department of Homeland Security, um, right, recently came out with, right, came out with a report that very much showed that if the proper protocols and protections are in place, that the, 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 the vote by mail is a secure process. And the flip side, right, which is some of the, one of the things that you've talked about and we've spoken about, John, before, is, right, the implementation. And, and I think that's a, you're right, a different piece of the coin, and it's worth discussing, right? You know, I think that, um, you know, it's worth acknowledging that there's been a scaling up of vote by mail. Um, that's come about as a result of the pandemic. It's worth noting that in some recent elections in certain states, right, that there's been a, a higher rejection rate. Um, but it's important to parse out what those reasons are. And, and it's also important to note that as, a, that as a matter of course, that if adequate right, education and outreach can be done, and that if people are fully informed about what processes are in place, that the vast, vast, vast majority of people that make use of the vote by mail process will be able to conduct, right, be able to cast successfully their ballot. Um, and, I, and I think that's, a, you know, just a point that's really worth underscoring because, right, to Sam's point, you know, one of the things about the state of Maryland is that they've actually been pushing that. If you get your voter guide, they've been talking about that and, and there are reasons for it. And, you know, one of them, of course, is, is that the, it could you know, reduce the likelihood of contracting the coronavirus, right? But it's also because, you know, this, this is a process, as Sam alluded to, that's gone back as far as sort of the Civil War, right? Um, and that is a tried and true method of voting, which is not the case in every country. Doesn't mean that we do it perfectly across the board, John. I'm sure there'll be people with questions about how do you, you know, what processes in place are to cure ballots and what happens when there aren't signatures done. But by and large, this is absolutely a secure process and it's largely an accurate one too. Thanks, Cynthia. 
Yeah, uh, thank you. I'll just chime in to say um, one of my board members, Amber McReynolds, runs Boat at Home, which is very, she's very, very much embroiled in a lot of these conversations, which I agree should be nonpartisan, um, completely nonpartisan. And the people who make it a partisan conversation are the, the partisan um, implementers at the state level who are creating um, diverse and weird uh, 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 loopholes for voters to go through. You know, in some states, your signature has to match entirely in this way, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there's virtually no fraud in the sense that one might think like somebody prints out, you know, a thousand out and, and that, that fraud isn't happening. I would say there's a, a different kind of a, a problem happening in the United States, which is that we've partisanized the running of elections, which means, and we have such, we don't have a, an affirmative right to vote in this country. So there's not a, a net national standard that says um, voters, uh, you know, here are the provisions to make sure that everybody can cast a meaningful ballot. Uh, but one of the things that Amber McReynolds, who my board member, um, uh, the president was making this big point of people not soliciting ballots. And her point was that being the difference between a mail-in ballot and an absentee ballot. Her point is anybody who's registered to vote has solicited a ballot essentially. So it's completely the same. It's the same um, in meaning in every case. It's just somewhat of a different process later on in the process. But if you have registered to vote, you're signaling your intention to vote. And in order to vote, you need a ballot. So however it gets to you, um, you should get a mailed ballot. And, uh, you know, ideally there'd be the, the, the education to help people fill that in, but. Only because Cynthia raised Amber, the, the fulcrum, right, which um, is a sort of an independent publication, on Monday, right, introduced the election dissection blog, and Amber and I just put out a piece, right, on Monday that goes precisely over secure, the security of vote by mail. So I encourage folks to obviously take a look. I'll stop with the self promotion. <laughs> Please don't. I've got a question from. Excuse me. <laughs> We've got a question from Ben Sharp. This is for Cynthia, this one. Um, how in practice should universal voter registration, because obviously in the case of me, if you have universal voter registration, then you haven't necessarily solicited a ballot, but that's another question. For example, uh -huh. would it automatically register every, every resident over 18 on the census? Would they also be automatically registered to vote early or using an absentee ballot if applicable? Yes, I mean, I, I think that um, there are varieties of ways as it makes its way through different states, there are different rules that are being used. And that's, again, we have this this mosaic of states that determine the manner of elections. So um, it, it's going to continue to be that way. I think, yes, that um, people should be all all people should be registered. And I would argue uh, one of the things that FairVote did was work hard to make sure 17 and 18 year olds who are going to be uh, 18 by the time of the general election are also able to pre-register uh, so that everybody can get registered and ready to vote uh, while they're still um, learning about civics in school. Um, and then yes, everybody's able to vote. And, and I would argue that uh, not to set, open another topic area, but um, people who were incarcerated should be voting um, and people certainly who are on parole should be voting. I mean, we have somewhat arbitrary uh, completely arbitrary designations as to who's a viable voter um, based on what state you live in or jurisdiction you live in. I think that should be standardized as well. Sure. And right now, of course, in the United States, we have the motor voter. Uh, when you go to apply for a driver's license, you have an opt, uh, uh, an option to opt into the system. And I think those who are really working on it hard now would say, um, we need an opt out system, not an opt in system. In other words, everybody's in the system we're not, or at least I'm not proposing a compulsory system like Australia. Um, if you want to opt out for some reason, you may, but um, at least everybody's opted in and at the same level playing field from the get-go. Yeah, I mean, I think I would put a slightly more sort of moral valence on it. Like the fundamental problem in the United States is that your political rights are not automatically given to you by virtue of your humanity, right? Like that is the fundamental problem. The government through its, you know, sort of arbitrary decisions of what state you're in or what, you know, what forms you signed at what times can just take away your political rights, right? And, you know, I think, you know, this is a very salient issue in Baltimore here where, um, you know, the kind of mass incarceration issues, like, you know, when I was growing up in the early 2000s here, 
um, Martin O'Malley's um, crime policies were uh, arresting, I think, like 110,000 arrests, almost all of, um, you know, younger black men in a city of 600,000, you know, and so you, you basically almost every single uh, black Baltimorean male under a certain age was getting arrested every single year for the entire early 2000s. So you have entire swaths of America where people's political rights are regularly infringed upon by the by the state right and so i think what's what is so offensive about our our voting system is that it puts up all these barriers and sort of puts up all these hurdles to people um to people having those political rights and and it like you know and i think it's just that you know i think what's one something that's powerful in this moment is that people are seeing that for what it is which is a denial of the humanity of our neighbors and our um and our fellow americans and that you know that's you know that's what's happening so i so i anyhow, i just i think it's not um it's not just sort of a bureaucratic issue it's a it, it's it's about our our spiritual soul as a as a country thank you sam um i'll go to a question from michael staniashek who's at oxford university his um says it seems like part of the problem with the recent upsurge in authoritarianism worldwide is the fault of democratic nations not supporting each other and promoting or protecting democratic processes. On the other hand, authoritarians are very happy to help each other undermine these processes. Grave concern is a phrase that we commonly hear from diplomats and others, but how many countries actually follow those on, follow through on those concerns? I guess that's David. Uh, no. I appreciate the question, and I think it's. I think I think the points that are made are fair. I mean, I think, you know, we we've seen some um, right, discouraging trends uh, with regards to sort of authoritarianism on on a, on a global scale. Um, you know, the, the, this issue is not unique to the United States. Obviously, it's you know, um, and and I think a couple of things are, are worth noting. Right, one is, and I think it is incumbent in part on on, on democracies, and I don't just mean the United States; I mean others as well. To be thinking of right, what um, you know, um, amidst the current environment we live in, right? And I, when I talk about the current environment, I'm talking about the coronavirus pandemic, I'm talking about the ongoing threat of foreign inf um, of foreign interference. You know, I'm talking about sort of social unrest that stems from things like right the recent deaths and homicides of folks like George Floyd. We, you know, there has to be a proactive, positive vision of what democracy looks like. Um, it is not enough to sort of be responsive or to emulate the tactics of authoritarian right, actors. And, and that introduces its own sets of, of complications, right? Because, you know, it, it is, you know, by, by our very nature, right? We don't want to be in the business per se, for example, of regulating content right, on social media. And, and of course that, 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 you know, leads into some real difficult, challenging issues around Right, mis and disinformation that that exist. Um, I think another thing that's you know really important, and, and it's certainly something that the German Marshall Fund, the Alliance for Securing Democracy, harp on, is this really um, you know begs for right greater um, democratic alliances and more working together. Right, this this notion that you're going to go it alone, right, go it alone in the face of these kinds of threats, right, does not pass muster. Um, it, it's whether you're talking about working together to counter foreign interference in elections, right? Dealing with the coronavirus pandemic, right? Tearing down international institutions uh, that are critical, right? To promoting democracy is, is really, really important. And so I know that probably didn't get entirely at, right? The, these questions, but it's just sort of, I think a couple, you know, foods, foods for thought, because I know this could go in a whole different direction. Thank you, David. Um, I'm going to combine two questions now, one from Harry Bush and one from Liz Blunt. Uh, you probably know Harry is one of our members of staff. Liz Blunt is a former BBC uh, journalist. She says one of the issues of postal voting, what you've called mail-in ballots here in the UK, is the possibility of pressure within a household. Um, is Cynthia worried about how women not being free to vote as they wish because the head of the household fills in the ballots for the whole family? Do you think that's a problem, Cynthia? And, and the question from Harry is, Bear in mind all the disinformation, though, asserted disinformation about um, postal ballots or mail-in ballots. Do you think there's going to be a belief that those are less valid and it might, as a consequence, make pe fewer people engage with the election because they think their vote might not count? I'll go with Cynthia first. 
Um, I, I think the first question of, is quite interesting. Of course, in the, the anti-suffrage movement a um, hundred years ago was very much focused on the thought that women were going to just vote like their husbands anyway. So why, um, why let them vote? Which you would think if they're just going to vote like their husbands, then it shouldn't worry men so much because then, you know, the men were all in charge. Um, but I, I think that whatever vestiges of that remain, and I actually haven't seen any studies, uh, so I don't know any quantitative data on this, and I live in a bubble filled with um, former administration appointees and so forth, so I'm not the best judge of what all the other Americans think. I, I suspect if there is that kind of impact happening within within the household, that would play out whether it's a postal ballot or a going to the polls. I think in cases where there's that um, a rigidity, uh, and I'm just going to guess maybe men are more likely to wield that in a way that's persuasive, um, I suspect that might happen whether you're filling out a ballot um, with your husband standing next to you in a voting booth or in your husband's next to you in the other room and you're filling out a paper ballot. But as I say, I, it's not something that I'm particularly worried about, but I'm, I'm open if there are some studies or, or data or polling coming out. I think we, um, there's, but there's no evidence of that. But that's, but that's a little misleading because I'm not sure that anybody has studied that, at least that I know of. David and Sam maybe know otherwise. David. Yeah, I, I think to, to, to to go to just right, uh, expand upon what Cynthia said. At the National Academy of Sciences, I right, did a, a report in 2017, 2018, looking at right, the security of our vote. And, and I think you know, one of the things that they you know, noted, right, they did note that there's this possibility right, of, of coercion. But I think it's important to note the top line point, which is there's not evidence. Right? There's not documented evidence indicating, right, statistically sp speaking, that this is some kind of sort of significant issue. Now, you know, you can, uh, you know, so, and, and I think if there were, um, then we would see the trend lines, right, going in the other direction, right? And, and what we don't, what we see here in the United States playing out, right, is that we see more, right, sent to all registered voters. We see more voters that are going to be casting ballots, likely by mail than, than they ever have, right, before. Um, and so, you know, I think the top line point is there isn't evidence or anything documented to suggest that that is an issue, but it, it's certainly something to be, you know, I think it's certainly something to be fit, to be mindful of, and it's a fair question. One, uh, thanks, David. I'll just hop in quickly to say that the use of um, vote uh, mail ballots and in some states, ranked choice voting in primaries uh, on the Democratic side, the uh, results, you know, double or triple the number of voters participated. Um, so I think that's pretty significant. And we, as Sam said, I think there's a moral imperative to create the conditions where everybody can participate in democracy in this country. So in that sense, I think um, just sheer volume of people offsets that uh, concern. And, and there is data to suggest that having to arrange for a child care or a parent care, leaving your job, taking a bus, getting to a polling place on a rainy Tuesday in November is, is oppressive and does make it hard, does really uh, suppress voter turnout. And so that, um, th that's, that's where the evidence is right now. And uh, that's really been measured. And if you can allow people to do early voting or vote by mail, so they have a longer period of time to participate, I think uh, that really benefits people who, um, who don't have all the time in the world on a Tuesday afternoon to go wait in line for 10 hours. Sam, do you have any thoughts on this? And don't forget, the second part of the question was, do you think yeah. people are also um, concerned their votes might not count because of the, all the, the negative uh, media about mail-in ballots. Sam's on the move again. He's gone outside. I yeah, sorry. Sam, did you hear my question? Uh, yeah, sorry, I said to move out of something uh, loud in there. Um, I was going to pick up on the household issue real quick. We just did a study with those um, boxes I was mentioning, the party kits, and those were randomly distributed so uh, people would sign up and then they were in a lottery to either get a box or not get a box and the basically in the treatment group um if you were in the household of a high propensity voter who got a box and you're a low propensity voter 
you're 13% more likely than some than us a, a similar high propensity voter who requested a box but didn't so there's um, that's a pretty exciting finding for some of the scholars we're working with on the evaluation which shows that there is something about making the process more celebratory particularly that um, can kind of activate our high propensity voters to influence our the other people in their household now obviously the questioner is asking about sort of a more kind of coercive um, impact on vote choice, which I think is a lot harder to study. But there's definitely, I guess, the, the good news is that when you activate the act of voting itself it, within a household, that does appear to have an impact. Um, and so there's an interesting research question to be done about vote choice and, and some troubling stuff from um, corporations, about corporations that have, you know, sent sort of intimidating letters to people about about that. Um, the other question you had was about uh, people not trusting the process. Whether there might be depression of people voting because they might not think their vote might count because of all the negative media around mail-in ballots. Yeah, I mean, you know, definitely we, we've heard a lot of that here. I mean, yeah, I would say really that's probably one of the points of it is I think all the negative media is to try and stop people doing it. Yeah, I mean, definitely people um, really enjoy the ritual of going to vote. I mean, I think one thing that we focus on a lot is like, uh, you know, what, what makes it feel meaningful to go vote. And a lot of people, you know, are really used to their neighborhood polling place. You know, one thing we've heard a lot from some of our partners is that people are used to sort of seeing the same people from their neighborhood who work the polls, like this kind of a, a little bit of a ritual around it. But I think people are kind of replacing that with the like the drop boxes are actually a really big deal. Someone was just telling me that there was actually like literally right block from my house at the box by the art museum here. There's like a line at the drop box of people bringing their ballots back right now. People are creating new rituals around the the drop box. So I think the the number one piece of feedback isn't so much. I mean, definitely people are confused about the process. It doesn't like when you're at the site, you actually like put the ballot in the thing and it feels super real in a way that's a little bit less um, less satisfying in vote by mail. But I, I think one, as, as we talk to more and more voters, we're definitely hearing that people are just sort of creative about generating new rituals that make it feel meaningful in a new way. Now, and one of our, um, our uh, you know, what's one thing that's incumbent on us as democracy activists is to facilitate the creation of those rituals. It's not just about getting our election administrators to run the process well, it's about getting them to do it in a way that feels meaningful, right? And so that's, um, that's where the community part comes in. Thanks, Sam. Um, I've got a question from Brabuche Brahimi. She's in Kosovo. Um, and by the sounds of they're a much more functioning democracy than we do. Um, the question is about the value of votes. Okay, so in your presentation, Cynthia, you talked about the value of certain votes and other votes that don't matter. And reflect, reflecting on David's efforts to ensure that all votes were counted and that all votes matter, could you explain, both of you, explain whether all votes matter or they don't in the United States? I think talking about the first past the post system. I can, you know, I think, so I think there are a couple of pieces, right, that are important. So one, what Cynthia, I think, is talking about, right, is about some of the, um, you know, very much some of the from some of the frameworks, right, and some of the issues that it, that exist that, that are right, unique to sort of our electoral system and processes, and, and whether we're talking about right systems such as gerrymandering and how that process is done on an every ten-year basis, right, um, issues about right people's eligibility and the steps that they need to go through in order to be able to successfully cast a ballot, right, whether it's being able to talk about um, even just the, the some of the administrative hoopla that folks have to go through and, and what they sort of have to surmount as, as well as the voting systems themselves, right, and the choices that people have, right, and the notion of, you know, whether or not we should be, what kind of system we ought to have and, and whether, you know, how we ought to be counting votes, you know, I, I think one of the things that I think is, you know, really important for me is, is to echo a point that our former Director of National Intelligence, Dan Coates, put out recently, which is we really ought to be, you know, we need to be reassuring folks that if they Right? They cast a ballot that, in fact, it's going to be counted if they, if they do all the steps properly. Right? Now, if they're voting in a, in a presidential election in a state that's overwhelmingly Republican or Democrat, 
you know, does that mean that their vote is likely to make a difference in the final outcome? Perhaps not, but, but I, I think I'm really speaking to the fact that the votes ought to count, right? You know, that, that we shouldn't be hearing, if somebody sends in their ballot on time in the mail, right, they ought to both be able to, in most instances, right, hear back that the ballot got accepted and feel confident that it was cast and counted. Um, and I think that's an, you know, an important piece and, and one, unfortunately, that we haven't heard unanimously from all corners of government here in the U.S. All good points, David. Um, I would add that uh, one of the things that's very unique to the United States is that we vote on so many things. There are so many races up for election. So we vote on, on precinct level officials. We vote, uh, I vote in, in city uh, elections where I live. I vote on in county elections where I live. I vote for state legislature. I vote for statewide executive officials. I vote for uh, federal government officials and that I vote for the executive branch and I vote for judges. So it, um, I, it, it, I, I, I'm glad for that question because it makes me aware of how easy it is to be sloppy when one speaks. There is an election in the United States where your vote fundamentally matters, for sure. It just may vary from district to district depending on what, how many candidates are running and, and um, what the, the structure of the race is. But there's, there's certainly an incentive for all Americans to participate because there are just so many things to participate in. Um, some ballots are pages and pages long, filled with different races, and, and all those votes are Im important. And uh, really, in an ideal democracy, uh, there wouldn't be any drop off between the highest ballot office that we're voting for and the lowest office we're voting for. Um, and some of the states with the best voter education material, Colorado is, is among them, do a great job educating voters about every level of every race. And, and really they're able to then cast a meaningful ballot. But yes, my points about certain states mattering in the presidential election and in certain congressional districts, that's really a result of our winner take all voting system, which really um, privileges some states, some voters in some states who are deemed as swing voters and others um, where uh, it, you know, we know the outcome of the election in California or in New York or in Maryland, at least at the presidential level. Yeah, I think what, I mean, we, we do a lot of work with student voters. And one thing I do wanna raise about this, cause you know, I think the, the media does Americans a disservice by you know, talking about which races that count all the time. You know, we've got a, the, all the coverage is based on sort of which politicians are gonna win the election. And one thing we talk a lot about, particularly with young voters is, um, you know, the fact that the, the voting records, so the list of all the registered voters in which elections they vote in is public information, right? And when people run for office, they buy the list from the government of all the registered voters and they only knock on the doors of the people who vote and they skip the doors of the people who don't vote, right? And so, um, I, I think a lot of people really do not understand the sort of agenda setting power of who votes and who doesn't and the, um, and the power of the perception of who votes and who doesn't. So, you know, one, one example we talk about a lot is that, you know, free college is on the, you know, sort of U.S. political agenda right now. And that's largely because young people voted in really large numbers in 2008 in the Iowa caucuses. And then when Bernie and Hillary were running in 2016, it was perceived that they needed to win young voters. Whereas like prior to 2008, it was assumed that young people didn't participate in the Iowa caucuses, right? Now obviously there's, why do we care about the Iowa caucuses? That's a whole separate issue, but the, um, but the, that's but, 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 but that, that's very compelling to young, to a lot of the young people we work with that they, that we're trying to set the agenda about Baltimore being not overlooked in the state of Maryland, about young people not being overlooked in our process that and, and that's a very different frame than we normally get from the media. Thanks. Sam. Just one quick point, John, which is that yeah. and then I'll just let it go, which is that it's also, you know, voting is, is one of the last like the last line of defense and voters are the last line of defense in terms of countering against foreign interference. And of course, that notion isn't just unique to the United States, right? It's to 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 all the all the democracies that are out there that are conducting their elections that are concerned about authoritarian interference. Um, and, and, and of course, that's not just right, the U.S., but right, the U.K., France, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, another question. This one's for Sam. Um, 
you do a lot of outreach and community building and close to the election there's a lot of enthusiasm but once the election is done do you think he thinks people tend to lose interest how do you maintain at least part of the momentum you have once the election is done and people relax yeah so this is this is one reason uh we you know we created baltimore vote so a big problem with uh, mobilizing people around a candidate or a particular election is that it's uh, we call it it's a the narrative is a depreciating asset right so people get really excited about your candidate right and that's very motivating and urgent and they get involved but if your whole thing is built around the candidate and then the election happens you've got no reason for that group of people to keep working together right and so mobilizing around partisan identity can be sort of problematic from that point of view of long-term engagement, particularly when, um, you know, in the U.S. parties are very much sort of creatures of whoever is, um, is the top of the ticket, either the state or federal mm -hmm. level, which is a whole nother issue. Why don't, why, why we don't have stronger local political parties in the United States. But like the way Joe Biden in the last debate, if you watch that, he said, you know, I am the Democratic Party right now, which is like, you know, I think from an international perspective, it's pretty wild. Like they, like you would not have in a lot of countries, the leader of the party come out and, and, and make a statement. It's like totally that. the whole thing, yeah. yeah. So what we like, well, so what we try to do with Baltimore Votes is say, you know, uh, place-based identity is not a depreciating narrative, right? Like I'm gonna live in Baltimore, you know, for the rest of my life. You know, I'm a fifth generation Baltimorean. I'm from here, I own this house. Like this, th this is where I'm at. And so, um, uh, you know, so I, I think there's a much more that, that's a much better asset to build with people that like part of your identity as being from Detroit or Philadelphia or Baltimore or DC or Tacoma Park or wherever you are is that you vote in every election and you know we can build that at the neighborhood level at the you know with our when we, when we work with colleges we talk about like being a student at this place means that you vote in every election while you're a student and that is that appreciates so I think we need um, institutions and organizations that um, that mobilize around those kinds of identities that don't go away. Um, and we need to stop only covering and only giving attention to campaigns, parties, others that are mobilizing only around one uh, one day. I feel guilty about asking the next question now, Sam, now you've told me that. And the next one is up to Cynthia. What, what do you mean about the end of the electoral college? Obviously I'm aware, I think it's Arizona has a vote, doesn't it? Uh, this time it's Arizona that's got a vote on ending the that all their votes go to the electoral college to the winner of the national yes. share of the vote is that let right let me clarify that um the only other country sam and david maybe you know was argentina that had an electoral college i think it got rid of it in 1985 or 18, 1986 because it was seen as so baldly ridiculous of course no state <laughs> in the united states has an electoral college to vote for governor we would be you know that would be ridiculous um, so here we are, we have an electoral college. There's a great outfit that uh, Fair Vote has been involved with for now for a long time, since the 2000 election, uh, which is to um, ensure that the winner of the national popular vote uh, matches the winner of the electoral college vote by forming an interstate compact among states. And uh, when there are enough electors in that compact, those states award the winner of the national popular vote their electors. And so it's, it's not, um, there are some in the United States who I think are foolhardy uh, who talk about a constitutional amendment to about that that's not we're not gonna have any if we can't have a constitutional amendment on the ERA I definitely don't think we're gonna have a constitutional amendment on um, big systemic changes like abolishing the Electoral College but fortunately there is this great um, very successful national popular vote effort uh, underway to gather um, state commitments to award the winner of the uh, national popular vote their electors, thereby creating a um, synthesis between the Electoral College and the national popular vote going forward. And that's what I support. David, fan of the Electoral College? You know, I, yes, I, I think Cynthia has, has, has more to offer here. You know, I think one thing that I think is is really important to note, which I think you know, it is important, is that you know part of election integrity, right, is ensuring right that you have you, you want you want outcomes and results that are reflective of the will of citizens. Um, and and when you don't have that, right, uh, there are a number of potential consequences and spillover from that. You know, one from my end that I sort of see is it, is that provides right fodder and an opportunity 
for among others, foreign adversaries to exploit the system and, and suggest that the United States, for example, is no better than they are. Uh, and so, you know, it, it is, you know, I think one of the things that I, I'm, you know, as far as I'm involved in this is, is to sort of staying abreast and being mindful of the scenarios that could play out post-election um, and, and how adversaries might try and exploit them and how we need to be engaging with the American public so that they understand how these processes can play out and that they can be patient and disciplined as, as we expect maybe a longer election process than ordinary to play out for 2020. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's the one thing that we have been asking ourselves is to what extent it might take days or weeks before we get a result rather than the usual almost instantaneous result that you get in our states. Anyway, I'm conscious it's half past eight our time and therefore presumably not far off past, past three your time. Um, thank you very much all three of you for really fascinating and inspirational actually, I've got to be honest from my perspective, um, uh, thoughts on the US system and how you are looking to change it, defend it and also to campaign locally to improve people's access to voting. It's really been really interesting. Um, and I hope you all are successful in what you do. Um, and hopefully we'll see you soon in person, perhaps not this week or next month, but perhaps in a couple of years time for the midterms, we might see you then. And I'm coming to Baltimore. <laughs> nice to see you all. Thanks very much. Thank you.